Welcome everybody. I'm Lisa Jardine, and thank you for attending today's webinar. Just a few housekeeping items before we begin. This course is Bixie's accredited, and all attendees that remain online for 75% of the webinar will receive a certificate within the next five days. If you have communication issues during the webinar, no worries, simply log back in. We have disabled the chat function, but please feel free to add your questions to the Q&A and we will get to them at the end of the presentation. This webinar is being recorded and a link to the recording will be sent along with the certificate. We'll be giving away a few RF Solutions laptop backpacks at the end of the webinar, so stay tuned for instructions. I'm the Director of Communications at RF Solutions and Chris Godwin, our Chief Technology Officer, and I will lead you through the fundamentals of in-building public safety systems for the next hour. Chris is an expert in wireless technology with over 20 years of experience. He's been responsible for installing over 2,000 distributed antenna systems in private and public venues of all sizes. Our company, RF Solutions is an industry leader in the field of public safety communications. We partner with leading technology providers and manufacturers to deliver in-building life safety and wireless communications. In addition to public safety systems, the RFS portfolio includes in-building distributed antenna systems, or DAS, cellular reinforcement, and two-way radio communications. At our Solutions, we've established a culture of responsibility, knowing the criticality of in-building communications. We believe that we must help educate and expand industry knowledge as we know it can help save lives. We have a lot to cover in our, our one hour webinar. The topics will include, what are in-building public safety systems and how do they work? The origination of national fire codes NFPA and IFC, basic system components, which buildings require them, funding and ownership, roles and responsibilities, a typical project life cycle, types of public safety systems, design considerations, installation, and finally we'll end with a Q&A. Thank you, Lisa. So what are in-building public safety systems? I'm Chris Godwin, the Chief Technology Officer at RFS. It's my pleasure to walk you through this program and hopefully provide a better understanding of in-building public safety systems. Note that the systems and building codes we will be discussing are specific to the United States. In their simplest form, public safety systems allow first responders to communicate inside buildings. There are three major types. Today, the most common in-building public safety systems are called ERCS, that's E-R-R-C-S, which stands for Emergency Responder Radio Communication System. These are distributed antenna systems, also known as DAS, that are used only by first responders. They've become a mandated in-building requirement for most municipalities around the country. New York City's FDNY has a proprietary system called ARCS, Auxiliary Radio Communication System. This type of system works differently than ERCS and requires unique equipment. And lastly, there's FirstNet, a nationwide wireless broadband network for first responders being built and deployed through a first of its kind public-private partnership between the federal government and AT&T. We'll go into more depth describing each of these three types of systems later in the webinar. But how do they work? ERRCS and FirstNet systems essentially retransmit fire or police radio frequencies from outside a building where the signal is presumably stronger to inside the building where it is usually weaker or non-existent. This allows first responders to receive and transmit communications throughout a building and communicate back to their office or dispatch center. 
arcs uses infrastructure to enhance communications only inside a building. In this image, which is a typical citywide system for first responders, you can see how a wide area repeater is used to enable communications between units in the field and from those units back to their dispatcher. This allows coordination among all members of this group or team. Radio systems in major metropolitan areas or needing to cover large geographical areas often have multiple repeaters networked together to expand coverage. People may ask, why can't we just use cell phones? Public safety systems must provide reliable communication for large groups simultaneously. Cell phones are great for connecting with another person or two, but would fail miserably if used for public safety. And whenever there's an anomaly event, mobile networks get flooded with surge in call volume, straining the finite carrier bandwidth, which prevents users from making voice calls. On September 11th, fewer than one in 20 mobile phone calls in New York City were connected. The same thing happened after the August 2011 earthquake that shook the East Coast and in Boston after the Marathon bombing in 2013. There are other reasons why relying on cell service in an emergency is a bad idea, like extreme weather, the distance from a cell tower, and building materials, which we'll discuss later in the webinar. Once the components of a public safety system are in place, first responders communicate using PTT systems or push to talk, also known as land mobile radio. They use these dedicated systems because they have specific assigned frequencies and use secure technologies for voice and data communications. A properly designed system will provide first responders with reliable wide area coverage and centralized dispatching from their headquarters or a regional 911 center. In building public safety systems extend this coverage indoors. In order to understand why there is a national mandate for in building public safety systems, we need to look back at our past. Fire alarms and sprinkler systems have been around since the mid to late 1800s, and the codes for those systems were some of the first fire and building codes adopted in this country. By comparison, model code language for in-building wireless public safety communications is relatively new, less than 10 years old. The seminal event that drives the code creation happens on September 11th, 2001. But before we discuss what happens that day, it's essential to know the type of communications firefighters relied on before the code creation. In the 1980s, if you had a fire on the 32nd floor of a building, they'd search the building directory to find a telephone number of a company located on that floor. Once the firefighters arrived, they'd use that phone to call down to the chief officer command in the lobby. That was the only method of reliable communications available. From there, the technology moved on to using a crossband repeater to extend the range of a firefighter's handheld radio by using a dual band mobile or base radio located in the truck outside the building on fire. And then 9-11 happened and 343 firefighters die in the towers. A six month examination by the New York Times found that technical difficulties hobbled the rescuer's ability to save themselves and others. When the firefighters needed to communicate, their radio system failed, just as it had in those same buildings eight years earlier during the 1993 bombing at the Trade Center. No other agency lost communications on September 11th as broadly or to such devastating effect as the fire department. On July 22nd, 2004, the 9-11 Commission publishes its report a complete account of the circumstances surrounding the September 11th, 2001 terrorist attacks, including preparedness for and the immediate response to the attacks. Among the experts serving on the committee were code enforcement officials representing building and fire departments, design professionals, and fire protection engineers tasked with suggesting changes to the international code. 
one of which was the implementation of radio coverage systems within the building to allow emergency personnel to better communicate within the building and with emergency staff outside of the building, supporting the response. There are two international organizations that dictate standards for in-building public safety systems. The NFPA, or National Fire Protection Agency, and the IFC, the International Fire Code. In 1896, the NFPA, a global, self-funded nonprofit was established. The organization is devoted to eliminating death, injury, property, and economic loss due to fire, electrical, and related hazards. Since its founding, NFPA has evolved into an an institution with 68,000 members from around the globe. The NFPA initially addressed in-building radio coverage for first responders in 2007. Over the past 13 years, it has changed to reflect evolving technology. In 2022, the newly created NFPA 1225 Working Group will publish standards for emergency services communications. The ICC, or International Code Council, was formed in 1993 through the consolidation of three individual code organizations that had published uniform building codes starting in 1927. ICC then created the IFC, or International Fire Code, in 1994 by combining National Fire Prevention Code, Standard Fire Prevention Code, and the Uniform Fire Code into this new International Fire Code. IFC 510 began as a recommendation in the 2009 edition and became a model code in 2012. It has been adopted or is in use by 42 states plus the District of Columbia. It has a three-year development cycle and although the current code is a 2018 edition, Many states still reference the 2012 or 2015 editions in their building codes. The IFC code states that the fire code official shall maintain a document providing the specific technical information and documents for the emergency responder radio coverage system. This document shall contain, but not be limited to, the various frequencies required, location of radio sites, effective radiated power of radio sites and other supporting technical information. Let's look at the basic components of an ERRCS. An emergency responder radio communication system is typically comprised of four parts. A wide area repeater, which is the donor site. In addition, to citywide dispatch operations, it also provides the signal to be amplified from the radio tower to the donor antenna. A donor antenna is an antenna that receives signal from a radio tower or other transmission site, the donor. It delivers the signal into the building and can be mounted externally or internally. Most often the, roof time, the rooftop is the best location. Bidirectional amplifier or BDA receives, amplifies, and broadcasts the desired signals to and from the donor site, rebroadcasting throughout the building, and the distributed antenna system, or DAS, inside the building that distributes the signal. We'll go into these components in more detail later in the presentation. But which buildings require them? The short answer is any new construction building may require a system depending on its location and size. Renovation of an existing building, especially if it includes an updated fire alarm system, may also trigger a requirement for an in-building system. However, that is not always the case. The AHJ, or authority having jurisdiction, has the final say in which buildings require the systems. The AHJ articulates, interprets, and enforces the code that has been adopted by his or her city, town, county, or state. Every AHJ is part of a unique combination of agencies, including local or regional law enforcement, firefighting, and emergency medical services. 
These responders may be dispatched from varying locations and over radio systems using different technologies. Not all AHJs operate in the same way. Some have well-defined requirements while others have little to no documentation regarding requirements. Often we help AHJs develop requirements and processes, especially in smaller towns that depend on volunteer fire departments to meet their needs. Sometimes finding the appropriate AHJ will take a fair amount of effort, but the fire marshal is an excellent place to start. In building public safety communications is an unfunded mandate. The building owner absorbs the financial burden. There are risks involved with public safety systems due to the criticality of their function, not to mention the fact that there are constant changes to the code, which trigger enhancements to the systems and additional costs. Building owners are motivated to install in-building public safety systems, not only because it's mandated and they save lives, but also because their certificate of occupancy depends on it. The key players in an in-building public safety system include the AHJ, the architect or civil engineer, the general contractor, the electrical contractor, the fire alarm company, and the systems integrator. Each has a particular and vital role to play in designing, installing, testing, and certifying a public safety system. First, the AHJ sets forth the requirements. Next, the architect or civil engineer designing the building will provide CAD drawings for the system integrator to use when designing the system. If long horizontal cable runs are required, the system integrator may ask for a revision of the plans to include the installation of conduit runs within concrete floors. The AHJ will review and approve the plans provided by the systems integrator. The general contractor is responsible for the overall installation and often serves as a representative of the building owner. They may also create two hour fire rated pathways for the cable installation as required. The electrical contractor will install cabling, antennas, and signal splitters. They will also provide AC power as required. The fire alarm company will provide connections if the building's fire alarm monitoring and supervision are extended to include the in-building system. The systems integrator is responsible for designing the system and specifying the proper components. They will coordinate with the AHJ to make sure all requirements are met. And after installation is completed, they will hook up and connect the equipment and perform an extensive coverage test to obtain final approval from the AHJ. They may coordinate and attend the coverage test performed by the system integrator. And the AHJ's final approval is required before a certificate of occupancy will be issued. We've broken down a public safety system project life cycle into eight components. The bid specification, project creation, propagation modeling, the BDA and passive DAS design, testing, certification, day two monitoring and maintenance, and finally, annual testing and recertification. We'll now delve into each component. A public safety system begins with the bid specification. Before responding to a bid request, the system's integrator may need to visit the building's location to determine the received signal levels for each radio channel included in the new system. If a building has not yet been constructed, then signal measurements at ground level will be used to extrapolate expected levels on the rooftop. Upon project commencement, the systems integrator collects the information and drawings required for the design process. This involves a comprehensive on-site survey. They will also coordinate with a general contractor to define project scheduling and milestones. From there, the RF engineer at the systems integrator will begin the propagation modeling. 
the engineer will use CAD drawings to create a three-dimensional model of the building. A key component of this model is an accurate representation of building materials used because different materials have significantly different signal attenuation characteristics. This includes interior and exterior walls as well as the floors. This building model is then used to design a system utilizing a BDA and distributed antenna system or DAS that will provide adequate signal throughout the building without creating interference, which could degrade the wide area dispatch system. Locations for vertical cable runs are established using pathways that are two hour fire rated, such as internal stairways. Then antennas are strategically located to meet the civil signal level requirements. Power to individual antennas is balanced by using varying types of signal splitters. After the system has been installed, the system's integrator will commission and test everything. Each floor of the building will be divided into 20 or more grids and test equipment is used to measure and record signal levels at each grid. Additional tests are performed using portable radios borrowed from the various agencies to call back and forth to dispatchers. Representatives from the AHJ, Building Code Inspection Office, and or first responders may attend and observe the testing. Upon the completion of a successful test, a commissioning report is created and forwarded to the AHJ for approval and certification. So now your system is designed, installed, tested, and certified. But that doesn't mean you can set it and forget it. Building owners are legally required to ensure that their equipment never goes out of service without anyone realizing it. There's only one way to make sure that when the time comes, the system will work. The way you do that is with regular testing and inspections, what we at RF Solutions call day two support. This includes daily monitoring and testing. At RF Solutions, we provide a secure remote connection to the system to perform this function and keep a log at re regularly scheduled intervals no less than once a day. If the system fails to meet the performance standards, we are alerted and the issue is resolved. A public safety system protects the public, but the protection only works if the system works. Annual testing and recertification ensure system reliability. So let's talk about the different types of in-building public safety systems. First, ERCs. Earlier in the webinar, we mentioned that a typical in-building public safety ERCs is comprised of four major components, the donor site, donor antenna, bi-directional antenna, amplifier or BDA, and distributed antenna system or DAS. We'll now go into more detail about each of these components. Donor site, part of an existing first responder communication system, will be the signal source for our in-building system. The donor antenna is mounted on a building's rooftop with a clear line of sight path to seize the wireless signal from the public safety radio tower and to minimize coax cable run distances into the building. The donor roof antenna is directional and provides gain. It must have signal isolation from the indoor antennas Otherwise, it will cause signal feedback, known as oscillation. A bidirectional amplifier, or BDA, is precisely as its name implies. It's a device that supports two-way communications and amplifies the signal in both transmit and receive mode. Bidirectional amplifiers are most often used to extend the range of radio frequency systems. In a public safety system, the BDA selects which frequencies to amplify in the downlink and uplink paths and increases the RF signal strength in both directions. The FCC calls these amplifiers signal boosters, and there are definitive federal rules on their operation that must be followed by the system designer. National Code IFC 510 requires the BDA to have a 24-hour battery backup, while NFPA 1221 requires 12 hour battery backup.
When the donor antenna receives a signal from the donor site, it passes it to the BDA, which amplifies the signal and then sends a signal through a coaxial cable to various placements of internal coverage antennas. For example, in stairwells, interior space, and the basement. Coverage is broadcast from the internal antennas throughout the building, providing excellent signal and service to any first responders at that location. Here's a basic system in operation again, along with an in-building system that's been installed. The donor antenna now provides a signal path to access the citywide system. The bi-directional amplifier and antenna system ensure that portable radios inside the building have adequate connectivity. This allows them to transmit and receive between the units within the building and provides reliable communications as an extension of the overall system. The AHJ is solely responsible for interpreting the code for their jurisdiction. We thought it would be helpful to show you a couple of examples of these interpretations. In Boston, all new buildings, except one and two family dwellings, require radio coverage for fire and police within the building based upon the existing coverage levels of the public safety communication systems of the jurisdiction at the exterior of the building. If a building does not meet the required signal strength, NAG 95 dBm, the only effective solution is the installation of a signal booster or BDA. In addition, every system must have an approved maintenance contract with two hour response time 24 seven. Another example is Washington, D.C. Their AHJ is the Office of Unified Communication, and they have 29 discrete frequency pairs and 10 transmitter sites within the D.C. area. OUC monitors every system, and they must have the ability to shut a system down remotely via web browser access. Okay, now let's look at a non-typical public safety system New York City's ARCs. Most in-building public safety systems follow a design similar to the ones I just laid out. And then there's New York City, which you will see is a bit different from the rest of the country. In New York City, every new high-rise building must have a system to support FDNY communications throughout the structure. These are known as auxiliary radio communication systems or ARCs. Unlike the previous examples, which follow national codes, these systems do not link back to a dispatcher, but instead provide two separate radio channels for on-site command and control. Every building has a designated fire command center where a dedicated radio console or DRC is installed. Upon arriving at a building, FDNY activates the ARC system from this console using their elevator control key. This triggers the system, amplifying signals from firefighters' portable radios and retransmitting them throughout the building. There are additional control capabilities available at the console. This concept is designed to support teams of firefighters operating simultaneously in a high-rise building. So Chris, while we're on the subject of ARCs, I'd like to ask you a few questions about the equipment that's used in New York City. I know you were responsible for the design of the hardware and software for our company. And I was wondering if you could share the process you went through and some of the unique differences in ARCS equipment versus a BDA. Well, Lisa, we found that there was no company manufacturing high quality products that could be used off the shelf for ARC systems. In 2014, FDNY published strict standards and guidelines for the required control consoles and overall system functionality. These ARC systems are completely standalone and are a critical part of FDNY's operations at a high-rise fire. After consulting with FDNY, we decided to manage our, or to manufacture our own DRC or dispatch radio console and our own RAU, radio amplification unit, which is the heart of the system. We have since gained a reputation as the premier provider of high quality, reliable systems for this application. Unlike a BDA, the RAU does not retransmit signals until a specific 
building system is activated by FDNY when they are on site. Even so, every system must constantly self-test and monitor its components at all times. Thanks, Chris. And now for the last type of public safety system, FirstNet. We've gone in depth with the first two types of in-building public safety systems, ERRCS and ARCS. The last to discuss is FirstNet. FirstNet, like the others, arose from the aftermath of 9-11 and the need for a better communications network for first responders. That network is FirstNet, a nationwide high quality broadband network that gives first responder communications priority and preemption on all bands over the existing AT&T network with additional high quality spectrum dedicated to national public safety that has been set aside by the government as band 14. All 50 states and six U.S. territories, including the District of Columbia, have opted to participate in FirstNet as their public safety communications network. As of May 2020, FirstNet covers more than 2.61 million square miles using all AT&T LTE bands and band 14 spectrum. The first net goal is to provide wireless coverage that will reach more than 99% of Americans. To deliver on that promise, infrastructure needed to be built out to accommodate locations where AT&T coverage was spotty, such as in remote rural areas, but heavily populated cities where congestion can be problematic during an accident are also a challenge. And then there's the complication of purchasing FirstNet compatible devices. Now that we know the three types of in-building public safety systems, let's talk about the factors that must be taken into consideration when designing them. These include the building's characteristics in terms of square footage and building materials, the spectrum environment mandated by the particular AHJ, and any aesthetic concerns the client may have. These systems are not one size fits all. Each design is unique to the building in which it lives. As with any type of system that protects the public, it's important to use skilled and experienced RF engineers, superior products, proper installation, and daily monitoring and maintenance. IB Wave is the global industry standard technology for developing accurate wireless propagation. The IB Wave software creates a three dimensional model of the building that allows the IB Wave certified engineer to place network components and simulate performance, all while meeting the AHJ's specific code requirements. This type of modeling is critical to design's success. Ceiling height, Building materials and angled surfaces must be accurately depicted to ensure that the design corresponds to the actual building. Understanding and balancing the gains and losses in the system are critical to an effective public safety design. Here's an example of a design that we recently completed for a four-story residential building. This is the model that our engineer built in IB Wave. At this point, it looks like something that only an engineer could love. Based on our on-site measurements and using IB Wave calculations, we determined that there was adequate signal on the top two floors and that an in-building system would only be required for the cellar and the first two floors. This is the layout of the second floor. There's a vertical riser coming up from the cellar and seven antennas are required for coverage on this floor. The location of these antennas is optimized using propagation analysis based on our building model. Using the scale to the right, we must have coverage at or above the negative 95 dBm signal level over at least 95% of the floor. This prediction shows 98.2% of the floor covered at this level. Propagation is modeled for the entire building including signal transmitted between adjacent floors. In this illustration, 
equation, I removed the roof and top two floors from the drawing so you can see how it is modeled. Signal strength is calculated at a height of 48 inches above floor level. Finally, we create a riser diagram, which is a side view of the building showing what components will be on each floor. This, along with layout drawings for each floor, is used to prepare construction documents for the project, as well as a bill of materials. Thanks for walking us through those images, Chris. Now let's move on to discuss other important factors to take into consider in the consideration in the design phase, such as wall construction and attenuation. Attenuation is a reduction of signal strength during transmission. Causes of attenuation indoors are due to signals bouncing off of obstacles and penetrating construction material. Construction material materials continuously change in response to increased energy efficiency demands and carbon neutrality. Unfortunately, awareness within the construction industry of the effects that construction material choices have on wireless coverage is relatively low. And currently, there are no products in the marketplace that aim to mitigate these challenges. There are implications of the smart building on public safety that must always be taken into consideration. Concrete, steel, and low e-glass can all degrade RF communications. And in older buildings, the presence of lead can also result in obstructions to RF signal propagation. Another decision the systems integrator must make is whether to use an active or a passive DAS. An active DAS uses fiber optic cables to connect with remote nodes and requires a power source to operate. Active DAS is typically used in larger facilities with buildings over a million square feet and public venues such as football stadiums and airports. These active DAS can cover virtually any size building up to any capacity. Passive DAS systems use only passive components like coaxial cables, splitters, and diplexers to distribute signals. There are limitations to the reach of passive DAS solutions. Because they use coax cable to distribute signals, signal loss is higher than with active DAS. The further away the antennas are from the amplifier, the higher the signal loss. The signal loss results in lower downlink output power. These restrictions mean that the maximum coverage area for a passive DAS system is typically less than a million square feet. Passive DAS is approximately 80% of the market. Another aspect of, of design is meeting specific signal level requirements for proper operation. The signal delivered to the bidirectional amplifier is estimated by calculating the effective radiated power from the transmitter site, the path loss based on the distance to the donor roof antenna, and the gain of the donor roof antenna, as well as loss in the coaxial cable run to the BDA. After the installation has been completed, actual signal levels are measured at the BDA for confirmation. The gain of the BDA is adjusted to provide necessary signal levels to each of the antennas, overcoming loss in the cable runs and antenna taps or splitters. But we can't just crank up the gain as much as we want. Too much gain or poor antenna placement can allow the transmitted signal from the rooftop to reach interior antennas, creating a feedback loop through the BDA. This is similar to audio feedback that you might have experienced when a microphone is placed in front of a speaker fed by that mic. In this case, instead of a loud audible squeal, the signal creates an endless loop of interference that can block communications on the entire citywide radio system. This is what makes BDA gain and placement of antennas critical factors in proper system design. So let's talk about installation of these public safety systems. 
In building public safety systems in new construction can begin at the earliest stages of a building's life cycle, often requested by the engineering or consulting firms working on the project. The first order of business is to perform a complete building structure analysis to determine accurate radio frequency or RF propagation. From there, you need to look for the most cost efficient antenna placement and cable routes, verifying coverage against code requirements. Once a plan is created, it is reviewed by the client and the installers for acceptance. After installation, the cable plant must be tested before commissioning, looking for any known issues or problems. Finally, the system is commissioned as operational. The building will not receive their certificate of occupancy without a fully commissioned and tested public safety system in place. A project from inception to commissioning can take anywhere from six months to three years, depending on the construction schedule of the building. There are no one size fits all, or even most, in building public safety system designs. As we discussed earlier, specific building materials, such as wall composition and energy saving triple pane low E glass must be considered along with many other factors. Another aspect of new construction is the building's aesthetics. Co-op co boards and building owners can have precise demands regarding the appearance of installed systems, even when they are in the basement and stairways. As mentioned earlier, older buildings undergoing renovation or changes in occupancy classification may trigger the code requirement for in-building public safety systems. The challenges on these projects are twofold. The first is finding viable pathways, as you can see from the images on this slide. Legacy wiring in older buildings can make it very difficult. And second, these buildings are often occupied during the installation, which adds several layers of complexity as they require extra steps to minimize the interaction between construction activity and the day-to-day -day business operations in the building. The NFPA and IFC codes we discussed earlier require cabling to be protected for at least two hours of exposure to high temperatures. These are two examples of providing two hour fire rating of cable runs, constructing soffits and using fire wrap. Soffits typically take up a lot of space, anywhere from six to 12 inches and require 12 inches of clearance. Fire wrap requires conduit, takes up to eight inches of space and has an eight inch bend radius. The project constraints and budget will determine which protection is optimal. So let's look at a few of these components as they are actually installed. Here we have two red boxes mounted on the wall, the bi-directional amplifier and its associated battery backup equipment. There's cabling to the donor antenna on the roof and the six blue cables are feeds for a passive distributed antenna system. They're blue because those cables are plenum rated, but they're not suitable for outdoor use since there's no UV protection. So a different cable is used for the run to the rooftop donor antenna. The splitters and tappers have been chosen to provide the right amount of signal to each of these blue cables as per system design. This is the head end of an active DAS system there are fiber optic cables running to system nodes, which are located throughout the facility. To the left are backup batteries for this system. Two of our field engineers are checking and recording signal levels as the system is being commissioned. DAS antennas are mounted as specified in construction drawings. Typically, they're mounted below the ceiling for optimum performance. Occasionally, they can be mounted above drop ceilings but there's a significant coverage penalty that may require many more antennas if they're installed that way. This slide shows an ARC system console or DRC installed in the lobby of a residential building. It's protected by a cabinet with a latching cover as shown on the right. 
The system controller at the top of the console has two key switches for individual activation of each radio channel by FDNY. And this is a donor antenna mounted on a building's rooftop. It's aimed at the donor site by measuring signal level that it provides. In this case, we're using a ballast mount to hold the mast and antenna securely in place. This avoids the need to drill any penetrations through the roof. The ballast at the base must be sufficient to prevent any movement. In this case, that weight is provided by the cinder blocks. This is a solid rooftop, but if the roof topping were asphalt or membrane type, then we would need to have a pad under the mount to protect the roof surface. The antenna cable is protected by conduit as it leaves the mount. The location of this antenna was specifically chosen so that the wall behind the antenna provides shielding from interference that could be caused by another transmitter site in the opposite direction. Signal measurements after installation will be recorded and kept for future reference. This is important because the donor antenna is the starting point for troubleshooting of any problems that arise. This shows the source of an intermittent issue that may be difficult to track down. Chris and I have covered a lot in this past hour, but we'd like to boil it down to a few key points to remember. Public safety systems support first responder communications and they save lives. There are three types of public safety systems, ERRCS or ERCS, ARCS, ARCS, and FirstNet. Authorities having jurisdiction interpret the national codes. There are many factors to consider when designing a system and public safety systems must be monitored and tested daily and recertified on a prescribed schedule. And that concludes the informational portion of our webinar. Laura Keyes, one of our co-founders, has a list of questions that have come in during the webinar and will answer as many as we can. But before we start the Q&A, we'd like to mention our RF Solutions laptop backpack giveaway. We're very interested in hearing feedback about our webinar. So we're giving away a few 15 inch laptop backpacks with the RF logo. Just open your phone to the camera and scan the QR code. It will take you directly to our LinkedIn page where you can leave a comment. You can also go to our LinkedIn page using our URL on the screen. If you leave a comment, we'll enter your name for a chance to receive a backpack. We'll be sending you a link to the webinar along with your BICC certificate within the next five days. Okay, Thank you, Laura. Lisa, and thank you, Chris. Um, we did have a couple of questions that came in. One of them is, uh, can two-way radio systems or other wireless networks be combined with the public safety system? Well, that's a very good question that we were asked from time to time because you're already putting a full antenna system and network cable of cables within a, a high-rise building or other facility. And the answer is many times technically, yes, they can be combined um, to go ahead and, and use in-building two-way radio on the system. But it requires approval of the AHJ. So we do um, some additional engineering work to be able to prove that there will be no interference to the public safety system from any type of intermodulation or signals that you know that combine in in different ways and so forth on the network but uh, we have been able to get approval of those systems uh, both in new york city and and other areas as well and it again can result in a significant cost savings for the building so i, I guess i would also mention though it's very difficult to combine uh, public safety with typical cellular enhancement systems so that's not um, usually feasible just because of the different requirements for battery backup and coverage and so forth okay um, we had another question uh, are there are specific certifications or licenses either to deploy or to design public safety systems typically um, and by some of the codes, the, a, the AHJ requires that anyone installing or 
um, testing or working on these systems have uh, what's called a GROL or a general radio operator's license, which is issued by the FCC. It's just uh, requires uh, passing of a, a technical test for that. Um, in Florida, they have additional requirements for anyone designing or installing systems. In New York City, any company deploying these systems, uh, the ARC systems, has to be certified as a company by FDNY to do the work and any of the, the technicians or engineers actually doing the work and testing and certification have to have a separate um, certification as well. So it's pretty much up to the AH, local AHJ as to what they require. Okay. Um, and here's another popular question that we often get. Um, could you uh, give us any update or any word on two hour fire rated cables? There have been um, a couple of manufacturers which have cable that meets two hour fire rating of various uh, UL tests and so forth. And some AHJs will accept those cables in lieu of having a two hour fire rated pathway and others will not. And so it, it's important to seek that approval. Um, for that, there have not been good standards established yet for the, the testing of coaxial cables so that the, the fire rating testing that's done is actually um, what's required for regular copper wire and, and to have continuity afterwards. But um, the, again, the AHJs don't always accept that because it's not a testing of the actual, how well it, the cable works and carries signal after uh, being in two hours of fire at, at 850 degrees Fahrenheit and then sprayed with cold water. And there's, you know, there's a whole testing process, but again, they still have not uh, definitively apl have applied it for coaxial cable. Okay. Um, the, you discussed the Florida requirement. What do you mean? Um, is that the new yes. license endorsement? Yes, yes. Florida, um, various AHJs in Florida have, have come with strict requirements for both new and existing buildings. And they, they have set some standards for um, people who, who do that work. So yes, that's exactly right. Okay. Um, in public safety, is Tetra planning different from first responder or is that the same? Tetra is a, a digital technology that is used for uh, radio transmission and it is, um, it will be modeled the same way as any other Tech, digital technology or analog technology that the first responders may be using. So it's it's not different and the, the same software is used um, for modeling and the same hardware, both BDAs and, and distributed antenna systems used for those systems. And Tetra could be or added to any um, properly designed and installed system. Okay. Um, another question on IBWAVE. Is IB Wave required for simulation on ARC systems, or is there another modeling software that could be used? That's a good question. I guess uh, it depends on what you, how you define required. But we've looked at other modeling software and found that it is quite deficient in many regards compared to IB Wave for making accurate predictions of the um, propagation. And especially when you're talking about arc systems, you're looking at New York City, high rise buildings, where in addition to getting the good coverage within the building, you don't want to have too much coverage outside the building. In other words, you don't want to be spraying signal from the, you know, the 80th floor of a building out across, all across Manhattan or anything else. So it's important to, uh, to design well for that. Okay. Again, specifically in, in New York City, has the FDNY approved a hybrid ARCS distributed antenna system to date on new buildings? 
Um, I wonder if um, that is, uh, Peter, maybe you could expand on that a little bit. Are you talking about an active system with, uh, with yeah, an art system? Right, in other words, hybrid combining, combining um, arcs with what, either you're talking about active, yeah, active DAS or combining arcs with something else. So yeah, please give us a little further information. Yes, um, Peter says yes. Yes. So I guess we're talking about active systems. Um, yes, they have approved some active DAS systems for new buildings. But they're, again, they're, they're standalone and not integrated with any other systems within the building. Okay. Uh, again, back to Florida. Um, the two hour fire rated pathway donor cables required in, fire in Florida, but not for the horizontal pathways. Um, they usually require one hour survival requirements. What is the new language going to be to clarify this code language? I don't wanna speculate, unfortunately, on what uh, Florida will be requiring because they're, they make, they've made up their own adaptation of code and um, until it's published, you really, you know, can't, I guess, tell what, what the new code's going to be. But um, typically, yeah, they, we, there's a realization that vertical runs and the, you know, the backbone of the system need to have two hour fire rating, but uh, individual antennas, which would probably just be melted in a fire anyway, um, don't always require having a two hour fire rated cable going all the way out to that antenna. And then, you know, and then the antenna sitting there and vulnerable anyway. So they're, they're looking at ways to do that. Typically what we do in our designs, um, especially in high rise buildings is have the two hour path, vertical pathways, and then have, we'll have multiple vertical pathways with antennas right within the pathway or, or right outside of it to avoid long horizontal runs. So, a building, there might be four stairways in a building, we use all four of them with vertical runs and then just antennas on each four instead of having one vertical run and long horizontal runs going out. Okay, and Michael gave us a little chuckle on your um, initial part of that answer. So uh, that's interesting. And then uh, just a follow up on the active um, hybrid DAS. Is that something that we recommend as a general rule or don't recommend? And I know we covered where yeah, those would be appropriate. Yeah, uh, uh, there's a lot more complexity involved with an active DAS system because of the um, head end that has to convert the, the radio signal into fiber optic. And then at the other end, it has to be converted back and then sent out to antennas. So um, unless, you have a, a very large building or maybe a campus environment where you need to get, get coverage where coax just won't do the job, then um, an active system or a hybrid system where uh, antennas closer to the, to the head end or the BDA or signal source can be passive and then just use an active solution further out. But it is, it's more expensive, more complex, and then you have these fiber optic remotes um, that not only have to be monitored, but each one has to have its own uh, battery backup and so forth. And it just, again, it's much more complex um, as well as more expensive. So we put that in when required and, and certainly I uh, use a hybrid model to keep cost and complexity down um, whenever we can. Okay. Well, that completes our webinar for this morning. Thank you for the terrific answers uh, to these questions that came in. And uh, if anybody has any questions in the future, please feel free to reach out to us at RF Solutions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.